It has been said already that a woman is sitting on the beast as harlot and murderess, and that she is supported by the beast, and that she also performs her function until the days of the eighth king. I on purpose left the question when the manifestation of the woman began. It appears now that she was already doing her gruesome work in the days of the world empires, the five which had vanished already in the days of John. In other words, the harlot is a concrete power which manifests itself through all ages in alliance with the beast and is nevertheless distinguished from it. The prophets were angry, were they not, against the apostate Israel, which broke the covenant with the Lord and entered into a covenant relationship with the world powers of those days. For which power laid violent hands upon the blood of the prophets? The world empire? or the apostate church. I already showed that Reverend Ploy is incorrect in his opinion that it is always the city, the state which carried out the executions. Rome did not crucify Christ, Jerusalem did. It was not the empire, but the false church. But there is something more to add. In his argument Reverend Ploy did not take into consideration that the harlot also in the days of the Old Testament killed the prophets. This again puts us on the track to identify the harlot who murdered the prophets. Again a number of verses. 1 Kings 19 verse 10 The children of Israel, not the Assyrians, have slain thy prophets. By whom did Jeremiah suffer? And Amos? When Jesus chastised the Pharisees, he also said, Matthew 23 verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood which is shed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. All murders which were committed against the prophets in the days of the Old Testament are put to the account of the apostate Israel, even without any cooperation of a world empire at all. I am therefore of the opinion that the question which power we have to understand behind the woman who slew the prophets can only be answered with it was Jerusalem, the false church. I refer here also to the verses mentioned before, Matthew 23 verse 37 and Acts 7 verse 52. In the days of the Old Testament it was always the ecclesiastical body who persecuted those who lived in holiness according to the word of the Lord. Let us now also then render the account. In the days of the Old Testament it was the harlot who drank herself drunk with the blood of the prophets and saints, the apostate Israel, Jerusalem. In John's own time, Revelation 2 verse 9, the Jews were the ones who persecuted God's church, because of which they were called a synagogue of Satan. The false church at the end of time was also identified as harlot by Gridanus. The harlot is again and again the same power in the beginning, middle and end of history. Perhaps Reverend Ploy will by now understand why I cannot follow Gridanus when he identifies the harlot to be, time and again, a different power. First the great Babylon, then especially the Roman world power of those days, and again at another time some different incorporation or world power. And finally the Papal Rome. In Court of Verklaring 2.52 Over against that I say that although the false church manifests itself every time in a different form, in the days of Ahab different than in the days of John, and in the time of the Antichrist different again, the woman is still a constant greatness just as the beast is a constant greatness. She is always distinguished from the beast, although she is sitting on it. Indeed, if the harlot is on the one hand this and on the other that, how would it be possible to obey the admonition, go out from her? The latter is only possible when she, at all times, represents the same greatness. That a harlot as constant greatness is to be distinguished from the beast, not only once in a while, but permanently, now also receives support from I, 
the announcement mentioned in Revelation 18 verse 9 that the kings which committed adultery with her are in mourning when they see her total destruction. In the beginning I already pointed out that we have to see the suggested adultery as an action between two parties, so that we have to make a distinction between the harlot and the kings of the earth. These latter ones are bearers of political power and, as such, are representatives of the world empire, and during the time of the collapse of this empire are the rulers of smaller territories. In all cases, they are political entities. That they are distinguished from the harlot appears also from this, that they are still functioning after the harlot has perished definitely. Otherwise, it would be impossible for them to act as mourners, as is mentioned in 18 verse 9. K. Also significant is what it says in 19 verse 7 and following. As soon as the harlot has perished, the marriage feast of the Lamb is coming, and then his wife is preparing herself. There is certainly dramatic power in this vision. The harlot has to perish, and then comes the exalted day of the bride. For harlot and bride are two female characters. The first one forgot the marriage's fidelity while the second prepared herself for this. It seems to me that this contrast certainly has something to say also. I admit, I would never base the whole exegesis on this contrast, only on the basis of the bride in 19 verse 7 as portraying the true church, I could not call the harlot the false church. But it becomes apparent in a totally different way that we, with harlot, must think of the false church. Thus this exegesis receives confirmation from this verse in retrospect, and our insight in the message of this chapter is intensified. For, and with this I switch over to the data classified under 1, we should pay attention to the question, what motivated John to portray the character mentioned here as a woman, or rather, what did God intend when he portrayed this power to us as a woman? If the world empire is meant here, then this question is difficult to answer. It is possible to say that this character of a woman is necessary in order to denounce her idolatrous practices, which are already called adultery in the Old Testament. I would expect this answer if not at the same time this world empire was shown to us in the recurring form of the beast. If it would be only a simple matter of idolatrous practices of the world power, then I could imagine that here, as well as in Isaiah 23 verse 17, Jeremiah 51 verse 7, and Nahum 3 verse 4, a character of a woman is brought into the picture. But there is a lot more at stake in this chapter on account of her power, her murder, her drunkenness, her culture, and her cooperation with political powers. The above answer becomes unacceptable when John embodies the political power in the beast and emphatically distinguishes the woman from the beast. Also the annotations to the Dort Study Bible put their explanation of the character of this woman immediately in antithesis with the one of chapter 12. Point A of the data under one is settled with this. The points B up to and including F as well as H came up for discussion in the previous articles already, with the discussion of the corresponding data of the second series. Thus there remains only one point which I mentioned under 1, namely G, the name of this woman. I wrote that John says that this name is a mystery, thus we should not think of the city Babylon nor of the state Babylon but this name must be understood in a spiritually transmitted way. Reverend Ploy has some objections. He says, Here we have to observe immediately that it certainly is a very inaccurate representation of the text to say that John calls the name of Babylon on the forehead of the woman a mystery. It says in Revelation 17 verse 5, and on her forehead a name written mystery, does it not? John does not call her name a mystery, but he says that her name is mystery. 
This inaccuracy immediately avenges itself, according to me, when Mystery is deprived of her very definite name character, and with Professor Holweda gets an adverbial character, in the sense of spiritually transmitted. Nothing is left here of the specific meaning of mystery, a revelation historical defined term. End of quote from Reverend Ploy. It seems like a telling blow at first glance, a very inaccurate representation of the text, for her name is mystery. Moreover, just like the attaching an adverbial quality to a name, apparently a proper name, and further on, not leaving anything of the specific meaning of a revelation historical defined term. Still, it seems more important and substantial than it is. For a, I believe that Reverend Ploy wrote these severe sentences with too much haste and without having consulted his Greek New Testament. Nestle, at least in the 1932 edition, which I used, did not include mystery at all in the name. He does not place the capitals until he presents the Greek text of the Great Babylon, and as such does not start the name until then. Therefore I may translate the Greek text just as well in this way, and on her forehead was written a name, a mystery, the great Babylon, etc. Does Reverend Ploy want more examples? He should consult Sclater, Charles, Bousset, Baim, Moffat, Commentary and New Translation, Lohmeyer, Kubel, Goodspeed, Jansen, Canisius translation, Borncam by Kettle 4, just to name a few, bits are immediately available to me. I also know that some include mystery in the name itself, but most of the ones I read certainly do not. B. Gridanus does include mystery in the name, but he still indicates this is not a proper name but a symbolic description of her being. Court of Verklaring, page 254. In other words, Gradanus, in spite of his translation, chooses essentially against Reverend Ploy, no proper name, and thus is not that far removed from my opinion, symbolic description. And the others, which I mentioned before in succession, translate as I did, a symbolic name. C. I really do not understand what the weighty revelation historical defined term here means, written even with an exclamation mark. I am very interested in the history of revelation, and I probably know what Reverend Ploy means when he says that the term mystery is defined revelation historically, but I believe that he should not apply this word so haphazardly. For not everywhere in the New Testament does this term receive the same definition and character. May I refer him to Kittle? I believe that I did not commit an inaccuracy as such, and can peacefully maintain that John describes that we have to understand the great Babylon symbolically and metaphorically. I have already explained at length why I understand this name as symbolic of the false church. D. The text of Revelation 17 itself also could have taught him that mystery does not belong to the proper name. The angel prepares himself in verse 7 to tell him the mystery of the woman. Here the thought is obvious that there is something dark and mysterious about the name Babylon, which the woman bears, for it needs explanation. This would not have been necessary if the woman had been the embodiment of the world empire. John and his readers know the scriptures well enough to know that the empire of their day was the continuation of the former Babylon. There was no mystery in this for them. But what did need an explanation was this, that beside the empire there was a different concrete body which did not bear the official name Babylon nor was it an empire, but essentially it still deserved the name Babylon because of her style and atmosphere. Mystery, in my opinion, 
also points in the ecclesiastical direction. Reverend Ploy seems to take it ill of me that I did not refer to the many scripture passages which are quoted in his Bible, published by Brandt. I myself do not have this edition. I always enjoy it when a Bible edition contains a lot of references. I do not know who took care of these references in the Brandt edition. But this reverence work as such is not necessarily authoritative. Reverend Ploy may be made aware that I indeed examined these references, but a lot more than just those of this short list. I get the impression that he comes to the conclusion that because in these references there is spoken of the world empire Babylon, and because John sometimes even literally quotes these places, that he, John, also must have a view on this world empire. Yet I think this to be too simplistic. The issue of the manner in which the Revelation gives quotations from the Old Testament and takes up characters out of this book and processes them in its own visions and symbols is in general much more complicated. One should not simply conclude that Isaiah 21 verse 9 is referring to the world empire of Babylon and that consequently Revelation 18 verse 2, which took over this word of Isaiah, does the same. Naturally, I cannot widely discuss this problem of the use of the Old Testament in the last book of the Bible within the confines of this presentation. But as far as method and style is concerned, in which John goes to work here, I had a lot of help from Scatter in his German book about the Old Testament in the Revelation of John, 1912. Furthermore, I will mention for this aspect of the argument A. Ferrer, A Rebirth of Images, 1949. I believe it to be essential to first orientate oneself to some extent with the general method which John follows before making far-reaching conclusions from certain quotations of the Old Testament. Moreover, I fail to understand why Reverend Ploy, when reading parallels from the Old Testament, limits himself to texts which speak of the world empire. Why did he not give this Revelation 18 verse 22 and 23 a reference to Jeremiah 25 verse 10, which emphatically deals with Jerusalem? It is fine with me if someone wants to draw parallels, but not biased ones. And in conclusion, I am of the opinion that exactly the fact that John when he introduces this woman to us as the great Babylon and precedes this with the signal of attention, remember this is a mystery, that exactly this fact has to guide us also in the consideration of the texts mentioned by Reverend Ploy. John saw the spirit of Babylon disclosed in the apostate church. Therefore all the threats which the prophets had spoken against Babylon also applied without any reservations to this unfaithful people of the Lord. Thus, in the destruction of the harlot, he could see fulfilled all the prophecies against Babylon. That is why he could also in his description of the judgment on the harlot digest everything which before was spoken of by the prophets against Babylon. It is easy to apply to the world power of the present all the sins which the Old Testament lashes onto the world powers of that time and all the judgments which it announces upon it. But it is a lot more difficult to determine this sinful spirit in the greatness which presents itself totally different and, as such, conceals her real being. Especially because of this, a very careful exegesis is a necessity so that we withdraw ourselves from the grasp of this woman, have no participation in her sins, and thus flee the judgment which awaits her. For I did not write or speak to snub others. The danger stood before me that also this time, just as again and again in history, the Reformation would be followed with a renewed adultery. I do not have a smooth theory of true or false church, and none of us need it. But it is a question of life and death for us all that we stay faithful to the Lord and keep His covenant. For this reason I spoke and wrote this brochure in addition to it, so that we might understand the scriptures, believe them and keep them.